A reading from the book of Sirach. Now will I recall God's works. What I have seen, I will describe. At God's word were his works brought into being. They do his will as he has ordained for them. As the rising sun is clear to all, so the glory of the Lord fills all his works. Yet even God's holy ones must fail in recounting the wonders of the Lord. Though God has given these, his hosts, the strength to stand firm before his glory, he plumbs the depths and penetrates the heart. Their innermost being he understands. The Most High possesses all knowledge and sees from of old the things that are to come. He makes known the past and the future and reveals the deepest secrets. No understanding does he lack. No single thing escapes him. Perennial is his almighty wisdom. He is from all eternity one and the same, with nothing added, nothing taken away. No need of a counselor for him. How beautiful are all his works, even to the spark and fleeting vision. The universe lives and abides forever. To meet each need, each creature is preserved. All of them differ one from another, yet none of them has he made in vain. For each in turn, as it comes, is good. Can one ever see enough of their splendor? The word of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Give thanks to the Lord on the harp. With the ten stringed lyre, chant his praises. Sing to him a new song. Pluck the strings skillfully with shouts of gladness. For upright is the word of the Lord, and all his works are trustworthy. He loves justice and right. Of the kindness of the Lord, the earth is full. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as in a flask. In cellars, he confines the deep. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all who dwell in the world revere him. For he spoke, and it was made. He commanded, and it stood forth. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. As Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, 
Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, get up, Jesus is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, master, I want to see. Jesus told him, go your way, your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. Verdum Domini. Some commentators see the emphasis on Bartimaeus, and it means son of Timaeus. His name means that. that Timaeus must have been a prominent person, had some stature that people would know. And his son here is reduced to having to beg, you know, for his livelihood to live, to survive. And it's a powerful image of Jesus here giving him his sight back and, and you know, helping him and, you know, in a sense, restoring him to fullness. And <clears throat> where he'd had a apparently some tremendous fall, not just outside of his loss of his physical sight, but being part of a prominent maybe family or something like that. Now he's begging. And it's an image of all of us that given to sin, we are really beat down. You know, we've lost what's most important. We've lost our greatest treasure, maybe sanctifying grace, maybe our relationship with God. And Jesus says it's so beautiful, he said, call him. And so they go and tell him, take courage, get up. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you. And that call is issued to all of us to get up. Sight here you know, can be seen as a great image of faith. You know, as he's restored to sight, you know, his faith is growing. Um, you know, they, it's a beautiful image of having this new vision of things, of seeing God more clearly, of recognizing his work, his care, his love for us. And that's a challenge for all of us. Jesus is calling us to something greater, to restoration, to healing, and to you know, be expectant of that call, to trust in that call. And yes, there's always the cross and difficulties we walk through and have in this life, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Whatever struggle, whatever difficulty we have to go through, he sustains us. And I think, too, sometimes, you know, we don't see clearly what God is doing. We don't see his plan here. We don't see how he's, he's at work, or we don't see how he's going to draw good from this. But we keep walking forward. And I, I see that, I can't say everybody's life, but I see that in a lot of people's lives, my own life. Sometimes things don't seem to be working out too good, you know? Uh, but we keep walking forward, and in hindsight, we can see, hey, God's hand was on me in all of that, through all of that. And it didn't happen the way I wanted it maybe to happen or think it should happen, but he's guiding us. And I think creation itself, we have this beautiful passage from Sirach, chapter 42, uh, this reflection on the beauty and grandeur of God. And I think we can see God's hand in creation. We can see that he is with us. It's an expression, the beauty of creation, the majesty of creation, the expression of his love and care for us. I heard someone say that recently. It was a systematic theologian, a Thomistic theologian was saying, and maybe he drew it from Thomas, but he was saying that it, you know, we see beautiful things in creation and we experience this feeling that, hey, that's, that's for me. 
It's a very kind of personal thing. You know, God's ordained this day for me. It's here for me today to see, to enjoy, to behold. And I think that's a beautiful way to see it. And sometimes we can miss it in the very simple, common, ordinary things. If we maybe, you know, always thinking about the extraordinary, but just simple beauties of nature, you know, like the grass, like the flowers, like the mountains, the valleys, streams that we see, the blue sky, the sun rising in the morning and setting. All these speak of the majesty and power of God. So Sirach begins this passage saying, now will I recall God's work, what I've seen, I will describe. And now, you know, there's the beauty of sight that we can see and enjoy these things, but also with the vision of faith that we see them as being created by God, that coming from the hands of a loving creator. At God's word were his works brought into being. They do his will as he ordained them. They're God's works. So our call is to receive them, to have this contemplative stance towards creation, to recognize even in the simplest of things, his workings. I think that's a temptation for us today against this is our entertainment culture where media can be so stimulating. The news can be so stimulating. You know, it kind of jumps out of the television and, and shakes you and rattles you and stirs up all these emotions and everything. And that cacophony can distract us from having a contemplative, receptive stance towards creation, to have this quiet, to recognize this for you aspect of the beauty of the wonder of creation. I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone. He's out in California, Southern California. And uh, <laughs> I was outside walking and We've, got, we've had a beautiful spring here and the birds were chirping away. I was taking it for granted. He said, man, y'all have all those birds down there? That's amazing. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was edified. I was taking it for granted. But we have a little bit of woods around here and you can walk and, and just hear the birds singing away with enthusiasm. Or just the colors. You know, I had a chance to go canoeing a couple of weeks ago Alabama's got a lot of rivers, and it's a beautiful blue sky. You know, we'd had lots of rain. The, the forest around the river was all green, and the color of the water, and the birds were going nuts. You know, it was, I, I just, I mean, it just hit me. I was battling the wind the whole time, so I was distracted. But at some points, I just say, man, just the color alone, the color alone is so striking and, and just energizing and calming and restorative. You know, I was recently reading a history of America and in the American Revolution, they had a lot of great preaching done, uh, Protestant preachers like 1750s and stuff. And, and one of their, and this, this respected historian was saying how vital this was to the American Revolution, to America's fight for freedom. And some of the themes of one of these preachers was an emphasis on the beauty of God. You know, Americans, early Americans seeing, you know, the forest and the great riches of, you know, this country with timber and, you know, you can grow all these different things and the streams and everything. Manhattan itself, I was reading about the history of Manhattan, it was this beautiful island, and they mowed it completely down and built a city, <laughs> but it had streams. Central Park today is a beautiful, if you've ever been to Central Park in New York, it is beautiful, and it was an attempt to, to reclaim a piece of creation for New Yorkers, that they can go and get out of the city and look at a tree or some water, you know, some green grass, and it is beautiful. I've been there a few times, and it is beautiful. And so, you know, the Americans had a sense of the gift of this country and its natural resources. And the preachers 
capitalized on this in their preaching and also even emphasizing the love of God, the gift of this, this country, and that we needed freedom to reciprocate that love. You know, that God gives us, we need freedom to love and that a, you know, a country's laws and should operate and champion freedom. You know, and I thought that was a beautiful part of our heritage as a country. So we're told here that God's word and his works brought into being all these things and he ordained them, that God is the creator of all. He himself is eternal, he does not have beginning or end. He's content, sufficient in himself. He doesn't need creation himself, but he has created it out of nothingness and has made it in an ordered way. And yes, we have a fall of man and we have, the catechism speaks of physical evil in the world and we see that in, in nature, the forces of nature can be so destructive but there's still this essential goodness and beauty. And that God, you know, his creation is not an emanation. The theologians are careful to say this. It's not a part of God. We don't, we're not believe in pantheism, but we say that God is in a sense in all these things because he has created them and at every moment he sustains them. So we, he says here, that the glory of God fills all his works, we say that God is not in the things as by way of his essence, but by way of his power, that he holds them in existence. So yes, creation very much uh, reflects God. We can see him in the beauty and the order of the things he has made and how he makes it all dependent on one another, that it's not self-sufficient, you know, any ecosystem, we can see that. We're taught that in the fourth grade, right? How this interdependence of things, that it's not self-sufficient. And St. Francis was very eloquent in this, you know, in his awe and wonder at God, recognizing the fraternity of creation, even calling material things brother and sister. So Francis would see the, the fraternity and the beauty of things. Bonaventure would write eloquently about these are footprints to God, these are vestiges of God, they're traces of God that point to God who is beauty himself. You know, one of these, these Protestant preachers in our early church, in our early history of this country talked about, you know, this beauty of this country sharing in the, the beauty of God. Well, wow, that sounds Catholic, you know. <laughs> that sounds. We started talking about participation. That's a that's a wonderful, strong Catholic theme. So all things have their right, proper place. We respect it. We don't divinize it, and we can see that in man's history. Sometimes overpowered by the beauty of things, they can worship a, a beautiful tree or something as if it was divine itself. But that's not fair to creation. You know, that's not even what it was intended for, and we certainly, you know, can't live that way because it can't deliver. The things, the creatures can't save us. They can't save us. Only God can save us. So God freely creates. He, he creates out of this overflowing of love, the overflowing of his glory, and that all things are meant to, to glorify God. That the glory of God fills all his works. You know, I, I like to think of that almost as a fire, that it lights it up, that it, it energizes it. it. It gives, you know, the glory of God is his radiance, his majesty, his holiness, and that kind of life is just invigorates all of creation, you know, if we're open to recognize it. We see uh, that he is, Sirach speaks of God, he is from all eternity one and the same. He does not change. He doesn't have an absolute need for his creation. And I think that's good news because he does it freely. He does it out of love for us. And those are the most beautiful gifts. 
He said in the passage ends, for in each in turn as it comes is good. You know, all these gifts of creatures. Can one ever see enough of their splendor? Can one ever see enough of their splendor? I think that's a beautiful thing to reflect on. You know, to recognize that even, you know, man in all his attempts at artistic endeavors trying to capture that splendor. You know, we have great works of art that can show it to some degree, uh, not its fullness, but some degree. And it, our art is so important in helping us to recognize it, to celebrate it, you know, to recognize that splendor of what God has created. And again, just drawing back to the gospel, our faith, you know, helps us to appreciate all of creation more because we see it as coming from the hands of a loving God. And it should motivate us to be good stewards of creation, to help others to share in it. And even, I haven't said anything about it, just man himself as glorifying God. You know, that faith enables us to behold God and glorify him in even, merit, even a, a greater way than you know, just our natural uh, abilities.